Welcome to A Time for Change. I'm Marquise Francis, joined by Alexis Christophers. Today, we begin by turning a lens back on our industry, the media. Nielsen, the company that tracks audience behavior, just announced a new initiative, this time to measure the reach and impact of minority-owned media companies. It's called the Diversity Media Equity Program, and it's designed to quantify the value of diverse media companies to advertisers. And here to talk about the changing media landscape is veteran journalist and philanthropist Soledad O'Brien. Soledad, it's great to meet you and welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's so great to meet you guys as well. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's amazing. You and I have been doing this for a hot minute and we've never really met before. So it is, it's a personal, personal pleasure to welcome you to the show, Soledad. Uh, I you was know, thinking the exact same thing, Alex. I was like, we literally have been doing this for a long time separately, and it's so nice to get to yeah. meet you finally, sort of kind of in person-ish, I guess. Exactly. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, we'll, we'll do it again when we're all back in the studio, when it'll be fun. But, but this will do for now. I'll definitely take the virtual. So, Soledad, this Nielsen report, you know, we dug into it a little bit, and it, it, as Marquis said, it highlights the power of diverse-owned media. And one of the big takeaways for me was that in markets with with black owned media, almost half of all black viewers typically watch the evening news. Now, if that's the case, are traditional media companies, you think, missing out on a big opportunity here? And are we at the point where these smaller media companies are giving those established networks like NBC, like CNN, a real run for their money? Yeah, I think part of the problem has been how I have seen it always historically work, which is news directors kind of have a, a gut about their community and their audience. And often that gut is wrong. So a gut in, uh, in cable news might tell you two congressmen screaming at each other is amazing television. I might argue it is not, right? So, so you end up sort of creating this programming that oftentimes is based around what the, the leadership thinks is their audience. And I think when you don't really know your audience or you don't think that, for example, if you think your evening audience, are you thinking African-Americans? Are you thinking like, wow, actually there's a whole bunch of people that we could capture that our audience doesn't necessarily have to be what just the news director thinks. And, and when you create a lot of diverse programming, I think you have this tremendous opportunity to bring more people in. We found this when we did a zillion years ago now, Black in America, and I remember, for CNN, and I remember, you know, there was like the unspoken, kind of spoken, you know, don't make it too Black. Like we have a white viewership, we want to not push them away, but we'd like to, you know, grow our Black viewership. And what we actually found was that kind of program, I mean, it was plenty Black, it was called Black in America, but it, it grew the white audience as well as the Black audience. And when we did Latino in America, interestingly, Latino in America grew our Black audience, right? So I think there are all these sorts of senses uh, and takes on what an audience wants and likes, and often it's just not accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to that point, Soledad, speaking of diverse just content, one of your latest projects with H is the HBO documentary called Black and Missing. And you really highlight how hard it is to get the attention of both media and even the police to search after these Black missing people in America. So I'm just curious, how hard was it, number one, to sell that show? And I'm curious, what, were your, what was your biggest learning? Yeah, that show is uh, streaming right now on HBO Max. And it wasn't so hard because I think HBO is always sort of willing to do an edgy topic. Um, but really, it was very critical, both of law enforcement and media when it comes to, well, why is there what our colleague who passed away now many years ago, Gwen Eiffel, used to call missing white woman syndrome, which was people would just go crazy. Media coverage, law enforcement, and regular people. If you were, you guys are too young for that. But Alexis and I remember <laughs> that during uh, the Natalie Holloway, not that she, we have just been around yeah. a minute, um, during the Natalie Holloway, um, when she was missing, literally there were people getting on planes to go to Aruba to search for that young woman. And I interviewed her mom a zillion times and, and deservedly so, she deserved a lot of airtime. It was a horrific story. But what you find is that young women in a similar situation who are women of color, black women don't get that same kind of coverage. And this is the question we wanted to ask was why the foundation, Black and Missing Foundation really was established to help um, the loved ones of people who've gone missing, you know, 
one, get the attention of the media, get the attention of law enforcement, get the attention of the community as well. Um, but, you know, that's a really good example of a gap. And often, you know, you'll say, well, but why is this woman's story not as interesting to you? Right. I mean, you know, a weird circumstance, a dramatic story and an attractive young woman. What is and you realize it at the end of the day it comes down to like, well, to an individual personally, they just didn't think that that girl was important. Her story was interesting. Her story would be rel relevant to the audience, whoever that audience is. And also often they just didn't think she was cute enough, that she just wasn't what they perceived to be the attractive damsel in distress. I wish I were making that up, but I am not. Yeah, that's a sad, sad reality. And we see it, you know, infiltrate all sorts of media to this day, which, which brings me to Black in America, which you uh, talked about just a minute ago, all the way back in 2008, your series on CNN. Since then, what kinds of changes have you seen in the kinds of stories that are being told Soledad, but also in the people who were telling those stories? You definitely see changes. I think you see more diversity on camera, but as all of us know, uh, the real power, right, is the person in the meeting that talks about what the direction of the network is going to be. So that's not always the anchor. The anchor, I think, has a fair amount of power, but, but often the person who's the executive producer or even the news president, right, is really deciding what the agenda of the network is going to be. Also, that's a position that can hire people. So hiring positions always mean that you have much more power to decide kind of what the tenor of the network is going to be in terms of uh, demographics uh, in, in, in the layout of the staff. So yeah, I, I think I've seen certainly more diversity in front of the camera, which is a big plus, um, but I would like to see more diversity in the higher ranking positions uh, in newsrooms across the board. And I think that that has been very slow to change. And if you look at the number of Latinos in newsrooms, that is crazy. Those numbers are so incredibly low. We don't even have to talk about Native Americans because they basically don't exist, as horrifying as that is to say. And Asian Americans is very, very low. I mean, there was a, a, a local reporter in New York who was uh, interviewed the other day talking about how um, you know, he, the person who was interviewing, who was a person he knew well, a friend said, you know, I don't find Asian American men attract, like I don't, uh, they, they scare me. <laughs> you know, like how, how are you supposed to move ahead if people are very clear, like they don't find you attractive or your race attractive and they, they don't find you, uh, they find you scary. I mean, you know, I don't know how you can hope to be successful in that kind of an environment. Yeah, really nauseating stories there. And recently, Soledad, you spoke at Carnegie Mellon University and you said, we've taken that step back um, for years when talking about race and equality. And I bet a lot of people right after the George Floyd murder would have thought, okay, America, now we're in a new place. We've taken so many steps forward. But I, I actually understand your sentiment in taking a, a few steps back. And I'd love for you to expound on that. What does that look like and I know on social media, particularly, I love the fact that you call out media companies. So I'd love for you to send a message to folks who may be watching this or maybe going to see this after the fact. What can media do a better job at when covering these kind of stories? Yeah, you know, I'll answer the second part first, which is I have found, and it's so not um, incredibly like, wow, as a response, just track it. What we have done, I, I, I anchor a syndicated show uh, that we co-produced with Hearst TV, which is called Matter of Fact, the Soledad O'Brien. And what we started to do, because our tagline is stories as diverse as America, was to track it. Are, are we actually telling stories as diverse as America? <laughs> you know, like, who do we put on TV? And we have a spreadsheet that tracks who is on our air. That's it. We just make sure we do it. And you see your own bias when you start to track those things. You know, you really begin to determine, like, you know, who, how are we telling these stories? For example, if we did missing person stories, you know, would we find like, wow, it seems like all the missing people stories we're doing are young white women. That's interesting. I wonder why. So I think one way to really make a change is to start tracking and holding yourself accountable because I, I do think sometimes those, um, those errors or those lack of, the lack of insight is, is not intentional. It's just bias and you just don't necessarily see those big gaping holes, again, because you feel comfortable, but you know, you, you, you have a sense like, oh, I am my audience. And often I am not my audience. My audience is very diverse. And so I need to make sure I'm covering a lot of ground, number one. Yeah, I do think we take a step back because I think TV news loves to be very self-congratulatory. 
versus you know coming up with a plan. If we were not talking about diversity, but we were talking about refrigerators, right? We would map it out. We would have goals. We would come back every month and assess those goals. How did we do? Where are we falling short? How do we fix it? Why are we falling short? You know, if it were just a product, like a regular product, we would have no problem saying like, here's what we're trying to get to. And I think we have a real challenge often in um, holding ourselves accountable and really thinking about like, what do we want to get to and how do we get there? So yeah, in the wake of George Floyd, everyone was like, kumbaya, this is amazing. Well, it's only amazing if you see actual tangible change over time. You know, doing one special, doing one event, hiring one person is not actual change. What really makes change is where are you hiring people from? Don't be baffled that you can't mm -hmm. find any black employees when you actually, you know, go and recruit at Harvard and Yale and not at uh, organizations that serve overwhelming numbers of black people, you know, recruit in both places. And so I, I think it's just really all about holding oneself accountable, which at the end of the day isn't so complicated. Soledad O'Brien, we can go on and on here, but so, such a pleasure to have you on. We'll do it again when we can do this in person. Thanks so much for being with us. Nice to see you both. Thank you so much. Welcome back to A Time for Change. We are midway through Black History Month when companies go out of their way to show support, whether genuine or not. HP's chief invest or information officer is one of a handful of black execs at Fortune 500 companies, and he shared his thoughts on whether or not the month still holds any true value. Here's Anjali Kamlani. That's right, Alexis. I spoke to it's a chief. Officer Ron Garrier about a number of things and really HP right now holding a really good uh, record when it comes to looking at the numbers. 54% of board members are minorities. 27% of its U.S. employees uh, are, are diverse, though only 3.8% are black. So that's really important to keep in mind. Uh, Ron told me that uh, he, the son of uh, Haitian immigrants, is often the only black person in the room. And I spoke to him about that and what he's doing to open the door for others. My concerns are, are the same concerns I've had over the last 25 years in IT, is how do we diversify and get more people excited of color, Latinos, Blacks, into technology, not just in the technology that we use, the hardware and the great products that we offer here at HP, but getting into the, the world of technology, you know, artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, all that. It's very important for us to expand our aperture and bring in more people of color into this industry. I know that you have, you've talked about it just now, really just that constant uh, focus and it's 25 years is quite a long time. I think we can all agree <laughs> that there are still some concerns about the progress being made on this. And so I, I've seen strategies over the years being implemented, especially for hiring processes, right? Uh, things yes. like blinding candidates' names and genders, I'm sure you know this. What strategies have you really used and seen uh, that help to actually move the needle? Um, and, and how much work do you still think there needs to be done in order to sort of achieve really true diversity? Great question, Anjali. And so one of the main reasons that drew me to HP was the just history of diversity since Bill and Dave founded this organization, essentially that founded Silicon Valley. And so there's many things you could do. You can be very intentional and say, we are going to do X and you put strategies in place. And those strategies, in my opinion, they work on a broader scale, but we need more people to get more involved in younger parts of kids' lives, getting into the black and brown communities, explain to them what they could do with their careers, making the investments in those areas are just gonna change the game. And so at HP, we have the um, Diversity Equality Task Force, for example. There's many different things we're doing where we're partnering with HBCUs um, to make sure that we are actually going to where the talent is and really talking about the curriculum they need to build so we can hire that great talent. So um, HP is doing a lot of it, but again, my biggest concern, and this is where I love joining and, and working here, is that it has to be part of the fabric of the organization. It can't just be a flavor of the month, lack of a better term. It's gotta be something that we strive through year in and year out and hold ourselves accountable to those numbers and those efforts. How do you do that? Can you explain maybe behind the scenes, like are there metrics that are used? Uh, how do you ensure sort of growing in that direction? Correct. And so one of the things, many things we do is we want to make sure we have a diverse palette of, of resources, diverse palette of candidates. And so what we do is we actively go out and we partner with 
Black-owned businesses, Latino-owned businesses, uh, women-focused organizations, and help try to recruit from those organizations. Get out into the network and talk to them about what HP has to offer. Um, there's a lot of great things happening here at HP. So how do you get them excited about not just the problems that we have to fix, but the problems that we solve for our customers? And that's something our CEO, Enrique Loris, talks about a great deal. Uh, another thing that we're doing that I think is pretty exciting is that we're actually, we have a lot of suppliers that help us with our products and a lot of our services. And so what we're doing is we're diversifying our supplier base. We want to ensure that certain metrics that we're hiring certain number of black owned companies, Hispanic owned companies to make sure that we're working with them. And we see that as a multiplier effect. So if we hire those companies, they in turn will hire other companies and bring in more diverse talent to our, to our ecosystem. I think that's extremely important. I'm glad you brought up supplier diversity. That's something that has been seen as a really effective strategy over the years. But part of the problem still remains with that, um, you know, the red tape that goes with it. You need to prove uh, scalability. Yeah. Some yes. of the smaller uh, businesses tend to get left out sometimes. So yeah. I wonder, is there a solution for that? Or, or you know, because it's sort of a catch-22. They need the experience to work with you, but you're the experience they need to work with you. You're right. It's kind of a catch-22. And, and the thing that I really enjoy, I've worked in private sector for most of my career. For two years, I worked in the public sector. And so I was able to see on the other side what it's like to get other companies excited and jazz and invest into these companies. And so you're absolutely correct. The capital is sometimes not the greatest, but they need that experience to find that next opportunity. So what we're doing is we're actually bringing in uh, diverse owned companies, black owned, Hispanic owned, women owned companies. And we're actually having interview panels and our IT leadership team could interview different opportunities and we bring them in for projects. And the most important thing, Anjali, I think is pretty exciting. We're not bringing them in as staff augmentation to bring them in just to supplement and complement our team. That's clearly one way you could do it. But the, what we're doing, I think, is a little bit different. Hopefully, it's going to be kind of more sustainable. We're bringing them in for strategic projects. These are big projects that we're working on, and they can put this on their resume. They can say they helped this great organization move this forward. And, of course, it builds up their kind of um, plan of record. And right, and other companies will say, hey, they did this exceptional work with HP, they could do it for us. So we're really bringing them on to be more strategic partners as opposed to staff augmentation providers. And I think that is a huge change. Again, learned that from the public sector, and now I'm hopefully applying that back into the private sector. Any issues with supplier uh, diversity considering the chip shortage? Do you feel like that helps or hurts the situation? Can you still afford to really do this at such a time? Absolutely. I believe we absolutely should. And now's the time to do even more. And the reason I, I kind of flip it is because now's the time that that diversity is needed more than ever. Because usually when there's a ship shortage or shortage of any kind, you fall back on those big companies, those big opportunities. Now's the time to give those smaller organizations an opportunity and a leg up, right? And so now's the time to actually do more of that. And we're actually doing that. So we have some really hard uh, objectives that we're working towards so we can make sure that part of our spend goes to a lot of these diverse owned companies. Tell me about your experience, Ron, because oh. I feel like that's always, you know, that always really helps you. It's, it's a skill you have having been the only black person in a room sometimes. And I know we've heard many of these stories of some of the executives, a few that there are uh, in these positions who have faced some of the same problems as your everyday person, despite the levels of success you've reached, how have you maneuvered around these? And what advice can you possibly give to someone younger who's looking up to you? That's a, that's a great question. It's, a, it's one that I'm learning along the way. 25 years seems like a long time, quarter of a century in IT. What happened? But with that being said, I've learned a lot. And so before the term microaggression became a term, um, I would go to conferences. I would actually be the keynote speaker, but people would not know that. And they would look around the room and several times, full stop, they would assume that I am the valet or I am the uh, coffee attendant. And they would ask me, where's the coffee? And a few times, Anjali, I, I did not even get it. It was over my head. And I realized they're asking me to get them coffee. They're asking me to get them their car. And I'm looking at them, I'm a little confused. And then it dawns on me. They assume that I am the only person of color in the room. Therefore, whatever, they assume that I'm the one to help serve them here. And so what I've done in those times is there's moments where you have a moment. And in the moment, something my mom always told me, what is the learning from this? How could you improve the people around you? So I would have a conversation with them. Say, I think you were mistaken. I'm actually the keynote. I work for this organization. I am a peer of yours. Let's talk about this. Sometimes it's a great conversation. And some of those individuals are still friends today. 
sometimes it goes in deaf ears and they walk away and there was that moment. But for me, those are the things I really kind of just take and I, I process, right? Um, but what I do when I talk to young talent is I always tell them, bet on yourself. It's very important that if you don't bet on yourself, no one else will bet on you. Also, when you see a job opportunity, a lot of times minorities, women, they say, well, I don't do all 10 things, therefore I'm not gonna apply for it. Go for it. If there's seven of the 10 things that you're really good at, go for those, go for that opportunity. You never know what they're really looking for. So you really have to make a bet on yourself. And the last thing I'll say broadly, and I'll say this to everyone, uh, doesn't matter what race, creed, color, is speak your voice. You have to speak your voice. I've been in boardrooms as, you may know I'm on a board also and several boards and there's a lot of pre-meetings you have. And in those pre-meetings, everyone has a great idea. But when it comes down to the board meeting, there's wallflowers, right? And usually it's a minority or it's a female in the room. And I usually try to call out on them, not embarrass them, say, hey, you got Jan, John, Jerome, you had a great question during the pre-meeting. What are your thoughts? And you kind of bring into the room. So as leaders, I think we have to make sure inclusion is an action, not just a statement. So I think it's very important that we do that. But that's a great question. And again, I started as a repo agent for an automotive company. And, you know, I became a CIO. So if you don't bend yourself, who else is going to do it? Welcome back to A Time for Change. Black History Month is in full swing. Some people think it's time we move on from a single month to honor Black Americans. I talked to HP's Chief Information Officer, Ron Garrier, to ask his thoughts on whether or not the month still holds any true value for companies and the culture at large. I do believe it's important to highlight the value and contributions of Black Americans, African Americans in the United States, right? No different than a Latino Month, a Latino Month, Women's Month. So I do believe there's value in that. But the other thing is just, it gives kids, young kids of color, just an opportunity to really learn and focus on their history. Now we have 12 months to do that, of course, but that one month of focus is really exciting, right? You learn new things and I learn new things all the time. My background is Haitian American, right? And I still learn a lot from my African-American friends and colleagues. And so there's so much to learn. And I think this one month of focus is great. And the last thing on that statement is for corporations to focus on it and really talk about it, it's good to have the conversation. The absence of the conversation, it just falls in the background as white noise. And it shouldn't be white noise, it should be brought to the forefront. So I definitely support it, I think it makes sense. But again, it should be for all 12 months that we talk about all these issues, not just for 28 days or 29, if you're, you're talking about that every four years. So as you can hear, really a lot to think about. There are still some value and still some learning, as we know, Haitian Americans, not also not necessarily well versed as uh, as African Americans on the culture and history. So definitely something to keep in mind. That's our show for now. I'm Anjali Kamlani for myself, Marquise Francis and Alexis Christophers. Thank you for watching. But stay with us. There is still lots more ahead on Yahoo Finance Live.